Hello, my name is John Bindernagel. I'm a wildlife biologist and uh, this is the third segment in a series of three on the Sasquatch and on the unfolding discovery of the Sasquatch. And I alluded in the, at the end of the last section about some of the things that have inhibited serious Sasquatch research. And I want to, uh, I want to expand on that because I think it's quite important. And to me, the question for some time now has not been, does the Sasquatch exist or not? We know the Sasquatch does exist. The question is, why has the Sasquatch been treated as a scientifically taboo subject? Why is it not a subject of mainstream scientific research? Let's start with uh, one of my scientific heroes, E.O. Wilson of Harvard, who in his book, Consilience, wrote a very interesting paragraph about evidence and discovery. He said, he wrote, as evidence piles upon evidence, certain bodies of knowledge do gain universal acceptance. They ascend a scale of credibility from interesting to suggestive to persuasive and finally compelling and given enough time, obvious. Well, I put uh, E.O. Wilson's categories on, uh, on a scale, uh, which is the way I think he means that many bodies of evidence do lead to a tipping point where the results finally, after it being uh, interesting, suggestive, persuasive, compelling, and he says finally obvious, or I might say conclusive. No, but there's a problem because I don't think he's had to deal with the Sasquatch as an unfolding discovery. If he had, he would realize that in the case of the Sasquatch, there was a category below evidence being interesting, and that is that the evidence is unreasonable, irrelevant, or baseless. And that's what we seem to have happened here. And when that happens, <coughs> there is a blockage. Uh, the evidence is more or less banned from moving up the scale to be found interesting, suggestive, persuasive, compelling, or eventually obvious. And what is this evidence? Well, we haven't talked about it here, but there's the aboriginal evidence of early Americans and First Nations people who've been describing the Sasquatch to us for many years, to put it mildly, but which we have kind of misinterpreted uh, when we interpret myth and legend too narrowly as referring to a supernatural being or a fictional being. Then there's the historical reports, such as we mentioned a little earlier, like the, the 1904 report from Oregon, where uh, miners actually described in a published newspaper account um, aspects of Sasquatch anatomy behavior. Then there are, you know, that might have been suggestive, persuasive, could have been the eyewitness descriptions, eyewitness drawings, and say, my goodness, there's this remarkable consistency in what people from New Mexico see, and Ontario see, and British Columbia see. And then there's evidence which some people have found to be compelling, that could be the Patterson-Gimlin film, which many of us do find compelling. And then finally, for some of us who are involved with tracks, I would suggest what we find, I won't say obvious, but conclusive, is, is are the tracks, which reveals the Sasquatch as a track leaving mammal and which could have brought us to the tipping point before now. So what is the evidence that's missing? Well obviously a cadaver of this lower a figure in the lower right here. A cadaver would be would change things overnight. Possibly DNA would do the same thing. And I think we would move with very conclusive evidence along those lines, especially a cadaver, immediately up to the tipping point of acceptance. Then what would happen? Then there would be these questions and the public would be say asking, my goodness, why do scientists appear to be surprised that the Sasquatch actually exists? Did they not see it coming? Was there, <laughs> I'm being a little bit facetious here, was there no scientific dialogue leading up to this? Well, we have tried to engage uh, our scientific colleagues in some dialogue leading up, up to us, trying to bring some of this other evidence to, to their attention for their sake, uh, because sooner or later we're going to have to deal with it. I think we're now going to, at some point, we're going to find ourselves having to go back and saying, oh my goodness, 
as long ago as 1904, the broadness of the Sasquatch foot was described. Oh my goodness, some of these eyewitness drawings are really quite good. They're very close to the actual cadaver, the actual type specimen we, we may have at some point, you know, that film. People always said it looked like a real animal, a real creature, not, 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 not a human in a fursuit, but a real animal in its own skin, not in a costume. Anyway, um, so that's kind of an interesting philosophical uh, take on it. Now, uh, some of my colleagues say they're skeptical, and, and that's fine. And others, more and more, are, are, are saying that they're agnostic. And, and I think the difference is kind of significant. A skeptic, according to the dictionary, denies or questions the validity of a stance or position and is doubtful regarding its validity. Okay, that, that's skepticism. An agnostic is unwilling to commit to an opinion about a subject. And this is kind of interesting because this is, these, these are the people who say, I don't know. I don't have enough information. I haven't really studied it, so I, I, I'm not in a position to say yes or no. Now, astronomer Carl Sagan, uh, towards the end of his career, became a science commentator, a real, almost a philosopher of science, and he was very strong about skepticism. He said, you know, we must be skeptical. But he cautions us about if we're being too skeptical by saying, but <clears throat> if you're only skeptical, then no idea makes it through to you. Every now and then, a new idea turns out to be on the mark, valid and wonderful. If you're only skeptical, you're going to miss the transforming discoveries in science, and this is strong, and you will be obstructing understanding and progress. That's, that's pretty strong language, and uh, it comes from a man who, who really boosts skepticism. So I, I found that pretty interesting coming from Carl Sagan. Now, when I do these presentations, and I, which I've been doing for, uh, for about 20 years now, and, and sometimes to scientific colleagues, more often to scientifically minded people, I'm always trying to figure out where these folks are, what, what have they heard about the Sasquatch, and what do they think of it. And I, I always think that roughly half a room full of people is skeptical, and the other half, more and more, is agnostic. I also realize, and I find this especially at universities, there is a, maybe not a small segment, maybe a large segment, that's strongly opposed to this whole idea. They find it preposterous. Some are even hostile. They're embarrassed that a person who can, calls himself a scientist with a PhD is, is taking this on and treating it, treating the Sasquatch as an existing North American mammal. They just find that, as I say, preposterous. Then, Again, again, this is this is a kind of evolving situation. Some people say, "Gee," and 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 they they, they, they we get they, they look at us as believers, and that that's that's a media thing. The media likes to call us believers, or even worse, true believers. And I like to say, "No, no, we're, we're not believers. There's no faith involved. We are convinced by the evidence." But anyway, there are these people who say, "Wow." You, you folks that have been studying this, you investigators, and are convinced, you're, you're ahead of the curve, aren't you? Well, not so fast. Thanks, but not so fast. Because for every person who thinks we're ahead of the curve, there's about 100 people that think we're delusional. And, haha, that's kind of, a, kind of a joke, but not completely a joke. Because there is so much evidence to support this feeling, this, this, this conclusion that we are delusional. For example, a book that came out in 2008, published by the prestigious University of California Press, titled Anatomy of a Beast, Obsession and Myth on the Trail of Bigfoot. And the author writes, if people can delude themselves into believing in the existence of an eight-foot-tall ape-man, what on earth might they be thinking about truly important matters? Well, this is obviously a uh, rhetorical question, but it's very strongly put. Another book also came out in 2008, and this is by Joshua Buse. Again, a prestigious university press, University of Chicago Press. His title, Bigfoot, Life and Times of a Legend. And Buse went to great pains to criticize and even ridicule the way Sasquatch research has been handled over the years. And this is kind of a touchy subject because Scientists have just avoided the subject completely, so it's been taken over by uh, amateur investigators, many of whom are very dedicated and, and, and very disciplined, others less so. But anyway, he, he does this job of 
ridiculing the Sasquatch research and, and the conclusion that the Sasquatch is an extant or existing North American mammal. So he, he got this review in Publishers Weekly by a reviewer who was uh, quite impressed with Bew's take on Sasquatch research. Buse is at his amused best when following the exploit, exploits of Bigfoot's handlers, the colorful band of true believers, hoaxers, and pseudo-documentarists who constructed this greatest of shaggy dog stories. Well, you can see that he's done a very good job of debunking the Sasquatch research as a serious activity, which, which was apparently his intent, and certainly worked with this, with this, with this reviewer. Because, you know, we are referred to as true believers, we're lumped with hoaxers, so casting tracks like this is not, document, not, not documentation of uh, scientific evidence, but it makes us pseudo-documentarists. So anyway, it, it, it's, it's difficult when this, this view is being promoted so strongly and being widely accepted, uh, and it being, 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 you know, published by scientific presses. Okay, now, I don't want to get too uh, deep here on this idea of truth, but there's a, a nice quote from Salman Rushdie in, in, his, in a piece of his writing called Facting, Finding Truth in Fact and Fiction. And he says, fine as the word truth sounds, truth is all too often unpalatable, awkward, unorthodox. The armies of received ideas are marshaled against it, yet it must, if at all possible, be told. Well, here, here you have it, you see. A few scientists, uh, like myself and a handful of others that have come before me and, and work alongside now, we are trying to tell this to bring our scientific colleagues online, to um, solicit their help because some of them are quite well funded and certainly more knowledgeable than some of the, some of the rest of us are. So one works at this and of course one is trying to uh, vindicate those amateur investigators and those eyewitnesses who've been willing to come forward saying this is what I saw, I made a drawing, here's the track I found, I have photographs and here's a cast and they're actually against a lot of social uh, ridicule coming forward. So uh, yes, that's the, uh, that's the end of that presentation and I hope some of that uh, is helpful because I think it's quite important. Thank you.